for the introduction, um, and um, I'm very happy to um, give the lecture here. Um, so, um, yeah, so basically, my, my uh, yeah, as, um, as actually uh, in, in, in the introduction, uh, so basically, I had a lot of collaborations with uh, Nicolas and Andre on the topic of just by the uh, which is the um, major part of my uh, lectures today and tomorrow. Um, so uh, my plan would be uh, to basically um, uh, work together with Nicolas to give an um, introduction of the, a, a series of work uh, we've done. And actually, Andre, although Andre is focusing on some other topics, um, lots of the uh, techniques uh, Andre already talked about are pretty relevant to our work. So um, yeah, so thanks to uh, Nicolas and Andre's earlier talks, uh, I guess I could, I, I don't need to introduce many things from the beginning. So uh, yeah, so that's, a, uh, that, that's my basic plan. So uh, last time Nicolas already introduced the uh, uh, model, basically the derivation of the just by uh, just by graphene model, um, which is very nice. And uh, um, so, um, yeah, so, so I'll just uh, start from there um, to talk about just by graphene. Um, and tomorrow uh, I will be focusing on the interaction uh, in just by graphene um, and some of the techniques actually um, Andrea already mentioned, but I will talk about some more uh, generic understandings um, uh, instead of the detailed calculation. Okay, um, yeah, so these are the main references I've been uh, covering. Uh, the first uh, acknowledgement, um, basically, um, yeah, these are all the theorists um, of these uh, works I've been covering, uh, and we also have uh, our mental um, collaborations with um, uh, Alini's group, Apto's group, and uh, uh, Imani Futu's group. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, Michael and Kaya are my students, and the other um, people are very nice uh, theoretical collaborations I have um, at Princeton here. Um, okay, so with that, let me just go into my outline. Yeah, so um, yeah, I'll try to, uh, so today my focus will uh, I'll be in, uh, on single particle physics. Um, I'll try if I can reach this part, uh, depending on time. Um, yeah, but if not, maybe I'll uh, switch it to, um, yeah, defer it to tomorrow's lecture. Okay, uh, so uh, in the first part, I'll be uh, starting with talking a little bit about the type binding models. Actually, Andre already gave a very nice uh, introduction to that. and. Um, in comparison, I'll talk about the just by the thing case. And then, uh, yeah, so basically, this is also um, mostly introduced by Nicolas uh, already. Uh, so, but I will more focus on the symmetry aspect of the model. And so, so that's the topic of the second part. I will talk about the symmetry from topology in just by the thing. Um, and then, um, I will show how, how do we generalize yeah, as a generalization of the symmetry analysis. That's what I'll be talking about. Um, um, I will give an example of near commemoration just by routine, which is the uh, work Michael and Kaiden did with me. Um, and lastly, if I have time, I'll talk a little about the uh, topological effect in hot Okay. Um, yeah, so the advanced and high value models, we've already seen um, many examples in the earlier um, talks. So, a very interesting example is the uh, um, the convolvulus, which are the red lines shown here. And uh, as Andrea has introduced, convolvulus is uh, actually a special uh, example uh, of, a, of the so-called large group of models called line graphs. Um, yeah, so basically, for these line graph um, type binding models, uh, Andrea has told us that we, we have a generic um, Generic proof that you, you can get a flat line from this uh, this model. So uh, here, just to, to briefly reveal what the concept of line graph, so I I uh, will not talk more talk about it again because Andrew already did. But basically, line graph means um, these lattice sites, for example, in the Kazan lattice case, um, sit on the uh, bounds of uh, of another lattice, which is the honeycomb lattice in this case, 
And if you construct if you construct a, a lattice using this method, basically by placing all the bounds, uh, all, all the sides on the bounds of uh, another lattice, then it's called a line graph. And there's a rule for uh, giving hoppings to these uh, line graphs. Basically, uh, two, two sides have uh, have a have a hopping only when the um, yeah they are connected by the same side of the underlying um, lattice. And for the line graphs, you can prove, uh, um, like Andre uh, did, that you always have a flat band. And in the Kavali lattice case, um, yeah, this is the band structure. As you can see, you get a perfectly flat band um, for this model for its nearest neighbor hopping in Kavali lattice. Okay. Um, yeah, so, um, well, Andre provided an understanding why you have the uh, flat band from the um, from the perspective of the null space of the uh, Hamiltonian. Um, here, and there's another way uh, to understand these flat bands, which, which is what I, uh, I'm going to uh, talk about. Um, basically, you can directly construct the, actually, the orbitals uh, of the wave functions, these flat bands, and show that they are the uh, um, exact eigenstates of the system. Um, yeah, actually, this is, a, this is usually uh, how a um, eigenstate in the flat band looks like. Um, and yeah, basically it's a wave function on six sides on a hexagon, um, but with um, amplitudes being equal in magnitude and opposite in size, um, like this. And why is this an eigen wave function? And basically, I recall that the model only have a nearest neighbor hopping, um, which is constant. So if, uh, if I want to hop outside this, uh, this hexagon, uh, it finds I get a contribution from this side. For example, I want to hop to this side. I got a contribution from this amplitude, which has a plus sign, and I got another contribution from this side, which has a negative sign. So the two uh, would cancel each other exactly. And um, and you can you can basically uh, see check at every corner um, the hopping um, outside this uh, uh, hexagon is zero. So that means this is a this is already an eigenwave function. Uh, of course. The energy is now zero because you know, since you have the contribution from hopping between the among these six sides, which gives you the energy which is minus two t. Um, and the fact that these eigenwave functions are local, basically they're just local localized on the hexagon. Um, that means this should be a flat band because you know if, if the dispersion is flat, then it's in some sense similar to atomic limit, uh, which you should have local orbitals. But this is not the Entire story. If you look at how many uh, independent wave functions you have, um, actually there, are, if you have own, uh, if you have n unit cells, there are actually only n minus one independent atom wave functions. That's because, yeah, basically, if you if you write down all these local wave functions and you sum over all the unit cells, you will find you get a zero. So there is one um, one atom um, state which is dependent on the other n minus one mode. So that means um, you can't construct a one, uh, one band with this n minus one mode because if you have a band, uh, electron band, you should have n, n states exactly. So it turns out there are these two additional independent modes, which are also eigenstates. Um, and the idea is the similar because you have the alternating signs, you find this is an eigenstate. And this state, just a, assume you have a, assuming you have a periodic boundary condition, then this is just a, a wave function on a single line, and you have two directions period, period so you have two actually two independent wave functions, and these wave functions are um, not local orbitals. So actually, that shows this band is actually not not entirely trivial. It's not a like a trivial orbital. Um, so in total, you have n plus one modes at the same end. Okay, so with n plus one modes, that actually tells you um, more. Basically, it says not only you have a band with n states, but also you have an additional state which has the same energy. Um, that turns out to be um, the degenerate point shown here. Yeah, basically, um, the fact you have n plus one states as a flat band energy means the other band has to touch this band at one point, and that's exactly the gamma point. Um, and actually, if you do the um, momentum of space calculation, it's a quadratic band touching um, Hamiltonian here. And actually, this um, this is indeed related topology. Um, 
Um, so basically, you can get this, you can get this, uh, get this point out by breaking the time rule system, actually. Um, but, but because of this gadget, actually the gadget smith here uh, is robust, uh, robustly protected um, by the original symmetry group of the atomic lattice if you don't break time rules. Um, and so, um, as a, yeah, basically, um, one of the reasons it's protected is because it has a, it has a non zero uh, barrier phase, so it's actually two pi barrier phase here. You can, you can view it as a quadratic Dirac point. Yeah. yeah. Can I go back to my slide? Yeah. Uh, why there is only those two lines? If you have a lattice of the hydromet lattice, there is probably can see the lines around this random line. So yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I should, I should explain it. Also, it's probably there's another direction. So basically, yeah, yeah, of course, you have three directions. But uh, yeah, basically, if you count the number of independent uh, eigenwave functions, they're just two. Because uh, if I if I write it down another eigenwave function on this line, it's actually this wave function plus all these hexagons on on this part on this row. So yeah, basically this is not an independent eigenwave function. And similarly, so basically you can find there's only two additional independent eigenwave functions. Okay. Um, yeah. So you can break the time rules symmetry by making the hopping um, complex. And uh, basically in in a realistic system. The breaking of time reversal can be done by adding a spin off coupling uh, and magnetic zone, et cetera. So basically, yeah, basically, you need to break the time reversal, or, yeah, of course, or you can make two copies of them um, without breaking time reversal. In that case, you, uh, you have, um, yeah, you have photo turn on the zero. Um, yeah, but for now, let's just uh, ignore the spin index and take a hopping complex. Then, um, actually, you can show that. Um, this band structure becomes gap. Yeah. And if you calculate the turn numbers of these bands, um, the turn number of the flat band becomes some trivial. It's, it's the turn number one band. Um, yeah, of course, the total turn number is zero. So the other two bands um, have turn number zero and minus one, effectively. OK. Uh, yeah, this is just a brief introduction to what turn number is. But since I guess many people already introduced it before my talk, so. I'll just uh, skip it. Uh, yeah, the, the only fact we know that is the turn number um, corresponds to the Hawk lattice, um, which can be measured experimentally. Okay, uh, now uh, back to uh, graphene. So, yeah, so you probably already know this. Uh, actually, Nicholas gave a, a detailed derivation even for the monolayer protein. So, you know that the, uh, um, for monolayer protein, the band structure. Uh, the low energy bands, uh, the low energy bits are concentrated on um, the band K and band K prime, uh, which are described by um, uh, Dirac equation. So that is Dirac equation, uh, Dirac term. Yeah. Um, but these two values have opposite um, so called helicity, or some people call it chirality. Um, yeah, I prefer to call it helicity because uh, two plus one is actually there's no chirofermion. Yeah. Um, so if I call it helicity. Um, so helicity basically means, yeah, as you can see, this uh, sigma here is basically a uh, two component vector, a poly matrix, sigma x and sigma y. So sigma star means um, sigma x and minus sigma y, because sigma y is imaginary, given certain imaginary. Um, yeah, so basically it's a distinction in between, uh, between sigma and sigma and star that tells you the helicity. Uh, and of course, if you if you define the bare phase um, properly, um, you could you could say at least the plus minus one corresponds to bare phase plus pi and minus pi effectively. Okay, and for two spider to feed, um, we know that's the uh, we already learned that the uh, uh, low energy phase can be approximately regarded as decoupled at value k and k prime. Um, and the two Dirac fermions of the two layers have a momentum difference because d one up to the more reciprocal vectors. Um, yeah, if you, if you uh, add one more reciprocal vector, it becomes P2 or P2A. So basically, these are three minimal um, momentums um, to hop uh, from one layer to the other. Um, and yeah, as uh, Nicholas has told, uh, has derived this, uh, derived this uh, model for this value between single value, uh, for example, value K here. 
um, which takes the form um, in the real space like this. It's a, basically a, a DB rough fermion between the two layers. Um, but here, uh, sigma matrix is rotated by, uh, the power matrix vector is rotated by angle theta over 2 because the upper layer is actually twisted by plus theta over 2 and the, the other layer is twisted by minus theta over 2. That's the only subtlety. Um, and this T matrix is basically the periodic Moray potential. So it should have the period um, of the Moray um, lattice vector. And to the lowest order, uh, they just repeat the two leading four components of it, which are, which are exactly like T1 to the T3, uh, we just uh, showed in the drawing as well. Um, and it turns out the TJ matrix uh, takes this form. If you, if, you, if, you, if you go down to the microscopic derivations, and this W0 and W1 are uh, having the physical meaning of AA, we call it AA hopping and AB, EA hopping. Um, the reason being that basically, as, as you know, in just by the thing, we have regions where um, the A sub lattice is on top of the, the other A sub lattice of the two layers. That's called AA region. And we have the AB region, similarly. Um, but you can note that this W0 uh, term uh, as a, yeah, it's a coefficient of sigma zero, uh, which is the identity matrix. So that means it's a hopping between the same sub lattice in the, in the two layers. So that's why W0 is a AA hopping and W1 is a AB hopping. Um, and yeah, and we, we all know that this model has extremely flat bands um, at this magic angle. And all these bands are four fold degenerate. So basically, you have four copies of these bands. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious if there's a like if you can provide a physical like intuitive sort of reason why W not needs to be less than or equal to W one compared to three parameters. Yeah, yeah very good question. So the um, a generic understanding is um, we know that for untwisted body routine, um, the ground state is AB stacking. Um, it's AB canal stacking. And AA stacking is actually an unstable configuration. So when you twist it, uh, you have regions of AA and AB. Um, so in general, the AA region is some, somewhat more unstable um, structurally. So it tends to shrink the region of AA um, than AB. So that makes W0 smaller. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so all of that has forward degeneracy because of the value K. And, uh, yeah, we have two values and two schemes. Um, so here, um, yeah, I want to, to provide a different aspect. Uh, basically, how do you see this key matrix take this form um, from symmetry analysis? And actually, the symmetry analysis is pretty generic, um, which you can apply to any other Moray model. Um, so in general, basically, um, a generic Moray model would just be, for example, I just consider bilayer it will be um, um, the effective model, if you write down the effective model in real space, it will be uh, the kinetic energy of the first layer, seen here, and kinetic energy of the second layer. And in between, it will be the Moray potential uh, between these two layers. And the Moray potential, just by, by the Moray periodicity, uh, it has to have the four components, um, basically given, given by the um, proper four, uh, four, four components you, you should have. Um, basically, these things come these different cues differ by um, the more reciprocal lattice uh, vector. Um, okay, so here, yeah, this is just definition of the power matrix rotated by angle theta C. Okay, so um, now our task is to determine what's the um, symmetry constraint on this T matrix. Um, yeah, actually, here we, we made an approximation that we only keep the three, the three matrix here. But actually, you can keep longer. Uh, longer hoppings as large as star Q, um, which are basically the same. So, um, yeah, so basically we, we need to see um, what these TJ matrix should look like. So, um, for that, um, we first look at what symmetries this, this body would be have. Um, these are basically all the, symmet all the discrete symmetries we have. Uh, actually, we have four, four of them. One is CCZ. Which is you rotate the entire system by 100 degrees, uh, 180 degrees, uh, by D, and kind of works with symmetry, um, and C3D, which is three fold rotation. And you have finally, we have the C2X, 
which is access defined in this access, so as in the key here, you can replace that out by um, pi. Um, yeah, the configuration recovers itself. But recall that our model here is sitting at a single value. Actually, C2, C2Z, we will take this value to the other value. And time also would also save momentum, so give you the other value. So within one value, you only have these three entries. Um, okay. Um, and yeah, okay. Let's take a little more um, details how these things really act. So C, uh, C2Z, yes, uh, C2Z basically would take, of course, R to minus R, and in momentum space, it would, it, it would change K to minus K. Um, and it switches A, B to the left, as you can see here, so by 120, uh, sorry, 180 degrees, so A and B switches. So um, basically, in the sublight space, it's a sigma hex matrix, which flips between A and B. And time reversal, time reversal doesn't do much things. It's just an anti-unitary um, um, operator. Here, uh, this is the spinless time reversal. It doesn't do anything to spin. So it's just a complex conjugate. Um, but it also flips the momentum. Actually, here, the momentum is split because of the complex conjugate. And C3Z, um, yeah, if you write down the matrix uh, of C3Z in the uh, sublimates, a B sub, uh, subspace is actually given by this matrix. Um, so here, basically, when you, when you do a C three Z position, it's A the lattice will take to another position, but Q or A is the lattice. So it's the it's the same. Uh, so basically, it's a diagonal in the sub lattice space. But there's a phase shift. That's because you shift the momentum from this k to this k. So this momentum shift to create um if you if you look at the uh, yeah, the position of this A sub lattice will give you the space vector here. So, so in this sense, it behaves pretty like a spin rotation. It's just a pseudo spin. You really treat sigma really as a pseudo spin. Um, and C2S, finally, C2S, of course, flips KY and it also flips A, A and B. So in the momentum, yeah, the momentum says KY goes to minus K to KY. KX remains. Uh, but also, it's actually a, also a sigma, sigma hex matrix. In the sublattice space. Um, but also it flips this layer. Yeah, so basically, I, I, I didn't write it down here because uh, we also need an operation one to two. Okay, so so basically, um, the first thing we know that is all the three, these three matrices, these three matrices are basically related by C3Z rotation because the three Qs are related by C3Z. So basically, by the C3Z, um, which we know the operator looks like this. We find T2 and T3 are related to T1 um, by this relation. Yeah, that's basically my C3Z transformation. Um, and so, so it is just a sufficient if we can find the form of T1, then T2 and T3 can be found immediately. For T1, the C2ZT uh, yeah, basically tells us a Hamiltonian at position R should flip, uh, yeah, should become uh, this. So this combined operator first it, uh, keeps the lie invariant, um, but also uh, C to Z flips R. So that we want R to flip to minus R, but also time reversal flips the uh, um, yeah, gives you a complex conjugation, and the C to Z also have a sigma hat which flips A B A and B sublast. So let's say the C to Z symmetry uh, T. C to Z T simply tells you your Hamiltonian has to satisfy this relation. Yeah, if you just plug in this um, this Hamiltonian here, um, you will find you see your constraint that T one uh, is equal to max T one complex conjugation times the max. And similarly, C to S and C to S yeah, similar um, similar um, constraint. Now you flip the layers as well, not only for the sublattice. So uh, this is the constraint from which this would give you um, T1 has to satisfy this condition. And in general, T1 is just a two by two matrix. And it's in general, two by two matrix can be written in terms of polar matrices and the identity matrix, sigma zero here, with unknown co coefficients, which could be complex before you uh, become known. Um, so these two conditions, we just plug in these two conditions to this answers. That will tell you uh, T2 is zero 
two has to be zero, and v uh, v zero v one has to be real, and v three has to be imaginary. Okay. Yeah, this this could work better for any more uh, system, not just um, um, the model here. So this tells me, and better if I um, rewrite these conditions in terms of some other parameters. This tells me. Um, yeah, so definitely this tells me I could have sigma zero term and sigma d term, but sigma d term could be an imaginary term, so I can summarize them into a complex uh, notation here. Um, and the other, so the, the other two provisions have to be real, uh, but also yeah, basically we, are, we were only determining JST1, which has J is one, but if you do the C3 notations, you can find all the CJs, which are given by this already. Yeah, but if you compare with the your CDG model, uh, we actually find there's an additional chi zero angle operator um, from our uh, angle parameter from our symmetry analysis. So why do we get one more parameter? Yeah, so that's actually because it's a little bit tricky. So that's because for just by being at small angles, you have another approximate mirror symmetry on Y. In general, you don't have this symmetry because when you yeah, basically, when you uh, do the mirror, uh, so mirror y is basically switching the y axis. So it's the mirror plans, the x actually, that could be a little bit confusing. Um, but by do the mirror, so you can basically this axis, um, my twist angle would become minus theta because, yeah, you flip the direction of twist. So in general, you don't have this m y symmetry. But if your angle is really small, like one degree, um, you could. You could think theta and minus theta are not very different, so you have this approximate mirror symmetry. And this mirror symmetry, if you do the same analysis, give you a relation T1, uh, a restriction for T1, like this. And if you plug in this angle here, you find chi zero has to be zero. Yeah, so that's how you derive the cis viability model without knowing all the details. Yes? Is that mirror symmetry? Only available for continuous approximation. Is that is what? Sorry. I think that mirror symmetry might be like available in the continuous approximation. Like we need to really approximate the Hamiltonian lattice model to continuous model. I think the mirror symmetry is you can mean? just find the mirror symmetry in the continuous model. Is that right? right. You can't really you can. I mean, like. You, we say like the mirror symmetry is not actual symmetry, but it's approximate. But I'm, I, is that exact in the continuous? No, it's it's not exact because in the, even in the continuum, um, you know the twist angle, right? The twist angle, you know, we, we know it's one point five degree. Uh, you don't need to know the microscopic detail. You can measure that angle. So that just means there is indeed a small chi zero. Actually, it's just so small that we really ignore it. Yeah, so uh, very good question. Okay, so let me proceed um, to. Yeah, so we've we already talked about some symmetries because we derived the model from symmetry. Um, yeah, so now um, there are some additional symmetries that we could model uh, in, in the specific case of this by the team. Um, yeah, so the first approximation, so sometimes we see people just uh, write it as sigma dot. Um, and without the twist angle. That's actually, again, an approximation. That's because this location is so small that you can just uh, ignore it to the zeroth order. And this approximation is called a zeroth angle approximation, a zero, zero angle approximation, which is uh, actually uh, used in the original description of McDonald's paper um, for deriving the magic angle and elliptic. Um, so here, uh, but when, when you take this approximation, that this uh, polynomial matrix is just unrelated to the action, um, you find the band structure actually has an exact, has an exact high cost in it. Let's say the band structure here, and yeah, the energy here and here are exactly the same. So you flip K and flip D, your band structure uh, remains the same. And so that, yeah, basically that, uh, is that there should be a symmetry. And if you if you search for um, the operator, this is the pi-core symmetry operator. 
again, it flips the two layers, um, but it doesn't flip the ABC logic. Um, there was a relative minus sign which is giving two flipping. Um, and what it does is, yeah, as, as, as you can see, it flips the momentum. And here we are considering a unitary operator. Um, so you flip momentum, that means you also flip the real states. Yeah, okay, so in real states, uh, it's actually something similar to inversion, but it's, it's, it's not exactly inversion. It flips the, uh, flips the position R to minus R, uh, but at the same time flips the sign of the energy. And the other symmetry, um, yeah, the other symmetry is probably it's only present in the so called Kyle limit when um, the AA Hoffman is exactly zero. This is basically some limit where assuming that the AA region just shrinks to zero, and uh, you have a, um, yeah, basically W0 um, goes to zero. And in this case, um, in this case, the band structure looks even more symmetric. Now, not only the energy that Opposite k are, uh, are opposite, but also the um, the energy at equal k are also opposite. So this indicates another symmetry, which is the chiral symmetry, um, yeah, which doesn't look there. Um, it's just a very simple. You just multiply by the p stabilized by minus one, um, and it flips the Hamiltonian without flipping the momentum or position. So in some sense, the c is a local object. It doesn't flip r, but p is now it flips the position. Okay. So um, yeah, so later um, Nicholas will be um, talking about that using these symmetries, you can actually show there's a U4 symmetry, which, which people have been talking about all the way. Um, the U4 symmetry between the two valleys and two spins are given four flavors. Okay. Um, yeah, so here, um, we're just going to talk a little more about the fragile topology of the two spider between the bands, which I guess you already know from the earlier talk. Um, but again, I'll provide a slight different um, way to look at the topology. Um, yeah, so, so basically, fragile topology um, is. Yeah, so basically, usually, for example, for, example, for translators, the topology is called a stable topology. That means it's robust against. Any perturbations, including adding tri uh, additional trivial orbitals, uh, like you attach another atomic limit insulator to it and turn on their Hawking, um, it doesn't, yeah, it does, it doesn't uh, kill the topology. Um, and in general, for for stable topology, stable topological band, you don't have local high binding models. Um, that's a consequence of the topology. Um, and fragile topology is basically topology that's weaker. So in this case, you can <coughs> have some very trivial bands um, and turn on the hoppings, um, which would make them all trivial. Uh, that's the naive definition. Uh, of course, you, it's not any trivial band that can be the stock. Right? It has to be certain trivial bands. Um, so. And this means, in the, in, uh, in the language of high binding models, I mean, if you just look at these two fragile topological bands, you can't provide a high body model for, for them. It has to be a long range, long range Hopkins model. Um, but when you add certain trivial orbitals, for example, if you can use the three bands together, you can provide maybe a three bands high body model for, uh, for this fragile topology, and to reflect this fragile topology. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, this, of course, you may still have many questions about this. Yeah. Um, so this is true also um, regarding the interlayer coupling. So if I know the one layer is topological, so if it's a fragile, so the binary three layer also be topological. Uh, yeah, very good question. So um, no, the answer is no. Uh, be, yeah, basically this binary between is kind of special. Um, mm -hmm. It requires it requires the um. um First, it requires the CPVT symmetry, as I, I was talking next slide, um, which uh, which could be gone like when you consider this double barrier, for example, because the double uh, yeah so the AB barrier doesn't doesn't have CPV, um, so there you don't have a symmetry to protect this fragile topology. 
Um, yeah, but something remains. Actually, for, for example, for Trilayer, uh, so Andrea has a paper on Trilayer algorithm, which shows um, it's a kind of so-called perfect metal in certain limits, which is kind of a you could think of it as a gapless version of this uh, bread up project we talked about here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here. Um, here, basically, the topology, the simplest way to understand this product of part is the no gap theory. Um, so, this part of the two model is hybridizing, which is a two Dirac fermion um, in the same valley. So, these two Dirac fermions in the same valley, they are, they are from this both valley K, so they actually have the same helicity. We call that the um, definition of helicity. Um, and if you try to write down a two band model, you actually you can never write write down two band chi body model with two uh, direct fermions with the same uh, helicity. So that uh, yeah, basically indicating it's topological, but it's actually bright out topological, and um, I'm going to show later. Okay, so first, uh, why is the direct point too low? Um, yeah, this requires the protection of CPD T symmetry. Um, yeah, the, the idea is again similar to our earlier analysis. That, um, if you if the Hamtomi has a C to Z C to Z T symmetry, C to Z T actually keeps momentum invariant. So both of them, both of these two are really split the momentum. Um, so it's a local operation in momentum space, and it gives you this constraint here. And similarly, you can just uh, yeah, just do a two band uh, example, assuming the Hamtomi um, have two bands, so it's a two by two matrix, then in general. Um, yeah, this is the this is the allowed Hamtomi um, under this condition. Basically, the sigma z term would be um, forbidden. Um, and with this, uh, with just the two um, two of the coefficients here um, in two dimensions, basically if e x and e y are both zero, you have a gapless point, and you do have two arrivals, which are k x and k y. So in general, you have point like solutions, which are which are basically direct points. So that's how direct points are protected in, um, in this case, in by C to ZT. Um, yeah, just, just in comparison, this uh, monolayer graphing model, chi by model, has two direct points with opposite hierarchies, as we mentioned. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, there are other ways, like Andrew talked about, to, uh, how, how do you uh, look at the top, this topology? Um, you can look at the high symmetry representations. Um, but the other way, uh, actually also, also first studied by Andre and others, um, to look at the topology is to look at the so-called Watson loop. Um, it's also detection of band topology. The Watson loop here um, is not in Watson loop of a physical gauge field in, uh, in high energy physics. But here, we know that in, in momentum space, we have a we have the barrier connection, which can be understood as a um, as a barrier uh, as a gauge loop in momentum space, and this Watson loop is basically um, a loop a Watson loop of the gauge field the barrier the barrier connection gauge field in momentum space. Um, yeah, so basically it's, it's it's totally equivalent to that definition, but here really numerically you can calculate the Watson loop in this way, and actually yeah you could you could do this for multi uh, multiple bands. Basically, you can define a non-abelian barrier connection for multiple bands. Um, so it's actually non-abelian Watson loop over here. Um, so equivalently, you can just uh, write the add, these are the n wave functions of uh, of the n band. So assume I have n band. Um, you just make this operator here, um, and yeah, this is basically a projector into these n bands at momentum space. And you just uh, uh, divide and yeah, choose some loop, some closed loop in the momentum space, and just multiply these projectors um, one by one by dividing the loop into many uh, small um, steps. And in the limit, the step is uh, infinite. And we, we recover the definition of the Watson loop in terms of the gauge field. Um, and this operator is gauge invariant because the loop is closed. Actually, you didn't do any um, state transformation. And so this is a better um, connection representation. And you can, yeah, basically you can diagonalize. Yeah, so, so for example, in this two-dimensional case, um, the Brillouin zone, I can always draw the Brillouin zone as a 
um, parallelogram. Uh, uh, basically, um, in this case, these two axes are k1 and k2. I can um, define the loop in along the k2 direction and use k1 as a um, variable, which I define as wk1. So by analyzing this uh, obvious wk1, uh, essentially, a unitary matrix with all the analysis will be um, norm one. So you can look at the angles, basically, um, of the norm one place vector. And these lambda j's are called, sometimes called the Wilson band. Um, basically, you can plot them as a function of k1. So note that uh, yeah, in, in, in dimension two, for example, the Wilson, the Wilson band will be in dimension one. Basically, the Wilson loop representation is always one dimension lower. And if you do this calculation for a single chain band, for example, you, you can already see the topology. Yeah, I could actually draw a trivial example. Maybe. Yeah. Okay, a trivial example would just be the line with a, for example, with our atom value being one, um, in atom K1. So you just get a, get a line here. But for a chain band, you can see the atom value. Uh, yeah, let me finish this figure. So you can see the atom value as one um, in the angle. From, yeah, from zero to two pi. Um, and this winding number is actually you can prove it's equivalent to the chain number. Um, it looks naively like this definition might depend on your choice of cycle. Um, the torus, is there a quick way to see why not? I, yes, it depends on the cycle. Yeah, so this is just the one way to define it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there you, you can actually choose the other ways. Um, but the, the goal is if you, if you choose the loop in a way that you can switch across all the entire um, Hilbert space, then the winding oh, number nice. is a constant. Nice. Yeah. Are there any restrictions on the winding numbers? Like, is there two pi or there are four pi is allowed, for example? Yeah, it's certainly allowed. Um, I don't think there are any restrictions. You can take any integer number. For example, in a turn number, a turn band case. The winding number is equal to turn number. <coughs> so if you have a turn number two band, you will wind four pi. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And this is the Wilson loop calculated for the spy between um, two flat bands. Um, and in this case, it's a little bit special. Actually, if you count the total uh, winding number, um, like the, we did for the turn number, uh, it's actually zero because we, we have a line. Uh, going from minus pi to plus pi, and another line going from plus pi to minus pi. Um, yeah, but here the counting rule is, is different. You only count one half of them uh, because of the CCGT symmetry. Actually, the CCGT symmetry, as, uh, as I'll show, ensures that you always have uh, two opposite eigenvalues. Um, so if you just count one of them, um, that's how you define the winding number here. So for this figure, um, you have a winding number one again, which is um, yeah, which is actually protected. So these um, these gaps are protected. Um, yeah, so it's protected here. Um, so you have to go from minus pi to plus pi um, con continuously. I mean, if you look at the derivative, it's continuous. Um, so uh, here you can easily prove this again for two band model. Um, again, we have the CCGT symmetry, and it gives you some uh, symmetry restrictions to um, the Wilson loop operator. And here, uh, yeah, this is the key term of this case. So, yeah, K1 remains, and it has a sigma x and compressed transition. So, your what to do while here is restricted to this, to this form. And uh, yeah, this, this tells you the what to do can only take this form, this very simple form, but only allow the sigma z term in the exponent. So, that means so then basically you only have one independent function. Which gives you two add values, um, two opposite add values, in plus and minus at k1. And of course, these uh, so these uh, these add values have to cross at zero and pi. So basically, that tells you that uh, these um, crossings at zero and pi are protected by CPZT symmetry. And of course, if you if you gap if you gap them, then you don't have any winding. This line can just go back to minus pi itself. Uh, so this this indicates CPGT is ensure uh, is is required to ensure the symmetry. Yeah, but um, this uh, so, uh, this um, topology is fragile uh, because you can actually add, for example, some trivial bands to the system, 
Um, and if they interact with each other, these, um, uh, yeah, they have multiple hobbies in between, and they could give you altogether a working group like this. In this case, you don't, you no longer have a winding domain as the cut line, so this uh, topology is broken. Um, that's, that's in a sense, you can add trivial bands to break this uh, fragile topology. Question? Yes. The thing is it that certain kind of trivial bands, mm -hmm. right? But right now, because when I, for example, I make the with a calculation with a bunch of states, right? Mm -hmm. And if I, if I want to include more bands, mm -hmm. I cannot, I don't know, I, I cannot control the certain <coughs> bands. It's, yes. It comes at a spectrum, right? So like, if I consider only two bands or four bands over, uh, is it possible that I get it sometimes the right trivial bands or how can I... Yeah, you, you can understand it that way. Actually, actually, the next example I'm going to talk about is is relevant. So, actually, in two spider between, you can think of the fragile topology as stable in some approximation. That's it. That can be exactly understood this way because the band you can add doesn't break the fragile topology. It, it, it requires some certain trivial band. Yeah, yes. so, uh, um, yes. the, the, the part of the topology related to the touching of the conduct and running spans and direct bands. Like, if you get past the direct bands, then you have to go back to the Uh Right. You, you have the way, for example, to get the direct bands um, to make either band trivial, right? Uh, to make both bands trivial. And in that case, yeah, it's as, as I mentioned here, um, the C to Z, yeah, so in that case, you break the C to Z key symmetry. So these crossings will be open. Then you will have, then this agamotto can just go from here to here. This goes from here to here, and then you don't have winding. But it can also make like back to churn bands as well, right? Yeah, it can. But, but if you calculate a Watson loop of two opposite churn bands, um, it's actually also trivial. Um, yeah, it's because the two bands together are true, are true. If you calculate only one band, it's a part. Yeah, so actually, Andrew already mentioned this. Uh, actually, in this slide, if you consider the high code symmetry we just mentioned as exact, then this fragile topology is actually stable. Uh, you can never um, trivialize by adding trivial bands. Um, yeah, here I will not show the details because uh, this is a more complete example. Um, but basically, with this additional particle symmetry um, operator, it gives you some additional constraints on the voice and loop operator. In particular, it tells you at P1, if you know in pi, the atomic has to be double degenerate. generate. Yeah, so this is just an example of showing you you can add, add additional bands satisfying uh, with this particle symmetry. Um, because of these, these double degeneracy points, um, the, uh, the winding number is actually protected. Um, but basically, uh, intuitively, the understanding is if you keep adding, keep adding, so if you keep adding particle symmetric band pairs to the um, to the fragile bands, you can actually prove um, it's not going to gap the trivial band, uh, the, the fragile topology of the flat band. So basically, you, you need to add some. Part, uh, some true bands breaking the particles into to trivialize this topology. Um, yeah, this is just a, so yeah, at, at smaller angles, actually more bands are connected to each other. But this answers the question that is, um, you should still get the uh, stable topology. Here. Okay, um, now, um, yeah, then I have. Um, have more than one hour or okay okay I'll, I'll probably finish this part and um, yeah maybe the half hour I'll break okay uh yeah so for another application yeah this is a work um that my students uh, Michael and Kyron uh, did today with me um so basically we showed earlier how to derive the two spider group model using um symmetry analysis and this, this is just another example, if I just uh, consider another model system, I can um, 
use the tenant matter to find a vacuum model, low energy model for, uh, for the system. Um, so the idea here is uh, in, to simplify the things, I can, uh, yeah, so in general, a certain shift angle given by this formula, if your language is still strictly periodic, uh, for example, in this case, um, it's about 38.2 degree. If you could have a new periodic lattice with supercell with n equals seven uh, inner cell, microscopic inner cells. Um, and so the idea is then if I twist a little bit away from this married angle, then it's uh, basically more resistant from the of this supercell. So you can again similarly have a more pattern and have a low energy continuum model. Um, so yeah, so basically the question is do we have to have magic angles that is this uh, non zero yeah this this angle is away from zero yeah I apologize for the interruption. Well, I do want to ask pretty quickly um, mm -hmm. what exactly does these special angles do they like, commensurate? What does it mean? Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah, commensurate just means means yeah, you can you can just say it's a exactly periodic lattice. Um yeah, for example, here at certain shift angle, uh, we have a overlapping atoms here between top and bottom layer. Mm -hmm. Um here we have it again. So you do have a strict period on this lattice at this angle. Strict period is it? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes. And this is actually a minimal example. Um, the minimal example to have is to have seven atoms, uh, seven new cells, so super cell. Yeah, and, and now the setup is like twist away from this angle by small and dark here. And basically, if you, if you do the symmetry analysis, it's basically the same thing um, we already did. Um, we, uh, the the slides have PCGP, PCMP, and uh, PCH symmetry. Um, but the, um, yeah. Uh, okay. So, okay, so, so the generic form of the Hamiltonian, that is material the shift term, shifting term, um, it will be again derived from the in the two layers, but now, now the angle is not, uh, cannot be ignored. Uh, of course, I will ignore the hour theta here in this, uh, in this setup here, but you can't ignore theta now. So, basically, this could be the phase derived from Um And this matrix PR, um, by our earlier analysis, uh, with these three symmetries, you have this form of um, the three matrices, P1, P2, P3. Um, and with this additional angle parameter. But now, um, with another this angle here now, actually, this mirror, mirror Y is uh, large, yeah, broken heavily. So you, you now not have this approximate mirror Y symmetry. So you do have one additional free parameter, which is chi zero. So that makes the model yeah, just a, um, one more parameter um, than the uh, this system and model. Okay. And um, it's, it's useful to just do a linear transformation to simplify the model um, a little bit. Um, actually, you can by this you can reduce one parameter. There's one less um, three parameter. Basically, I, uh, what I did is I take um, the direct fermions, the polymatrix here, back to zero angle. But accordingly, you will know, take these T matrices, um, this just mathematically, and uh, this rotation combines the two angles, chi naught in the direction of T matrix and the theta naught into a single angle. So there is actually just a single angle parameter in this model. And this angle parameter, um, yeah, this, that's because the effect of this angle parameter. Um, yeah, so this is an example of 38.2 degrees. Actually, you can fit these parameters from, um, from the chi bike models. Um, just find out, yeah, so in this case, I don't, I don't have to find out here, but basically, um, you see the effect of non zero find out is to break the particle symmetry. Yeah, it's actually actually similar uh, earlier. In just by the few model, you have to make a zero angle approximation to get particle symmetry. But here, uh, this theory now zero to break the particle symmetry um, explicitly. Um, and here, the first, you know, the so called first magic angle uh, is actually given by a very similar formula to the um, original zero angle twist by the T. 
Uh, but with the parameter exchanging, you know, actually the six and six angle is actually very small, unfortunately. Uh, it's not ex experimentally accessible, you know. Um, but basically, at this angle, um, you again get um, get a flat, a roughly flat band. Actually, this band can still be very flat. Uh, the, the only reason it's not flat is because um, it shifted upward and sh you know, has a hybridization with the higher non-flat band. But if you actually um, make make the AA hopping smaller, we can push the higher band to higher energies. These bands are still kind of flat. Uh, yeah, and and now you, you lose the particles in the middle. Okay, and this is the um, yeah, this is a this is a color map actually. Finally, so the those two bands as function of point out, the angle point is point out, and the y-axis can be understood as proportional to the angle, uh, to uh, the angle delta. You know? um, and this is the position of the first mesh angle um, line, so you can still see the dark, bright and dark lines that correspond to the first mesh angle mentioned. But there are also some other interesting things we noticed in that um, there are actually two. Several dark dark points here at pi out equal to pi over two, and so we look at this uh, band structure at this and uh, this special angle here, which is far away from the small angle the pi over two model. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, this is just another bandwidth scan and versus w zero and w one at the pi out um, over two uh, pi, pi over two. Yes. How do you actually control chi naught? Because it looks like you have experimental control of the theta naught as well. Right, yeah, very good question. So, yeah, so, so with this model, you can't, you cannot control chi naught. Uh, you have to be lucky enough to get a parameter there. So, that's uh, the other thing that we are actually studying now. Uh, we, there's, it's still under, uh, uh, we are still working on it uh, to find other realization of this chi naught equals pi over two model. Uh, it's going to be very interesting, yeah. Yeah, so, but now mathematically, uh, you already see that this model is actually very interesting, uh, pi over two. Uh, you get, you get, in this example here, you get seven that are simultaneously. And in another parameter, you can actually get nine, nine flat bands simultaneously. So we call this hypermagic manifold because you, know, you immediately get so many flat bands. Yes. Is it clear why this happens? Is what? Is it clear why it's hypermagic heavens? Why do you have that? Uh, yeah, so I mean, we only have partial answer, I guess. <laughs> yeah. What is that? This partial answer? Yeah, the partial answer is these flat bands are usually more stable because if you recall that these move with three bands are Kagami bands, as I mentioned earlier, and their flatness <coughs> are um, approximately protected. Yeah, if, if your hopping is almost nearest to the hopping, then would be very flat. So basically only these two bands, these two bands are group of two bands, which need kind of fine tuning, but the other flat bands. The, the, the field connected, right? It's, it's at the first uh, kick on The rest yeah, so, of them are connected. Yeah, so, so these group of seven bands actually are, actually there's a small gap here. So it's actually a group of three bands and four three. bands. Yeah. And there's also uh, three more or four more bands, which are related and isolated after six, after seven, down here. Down here? Yeah, yeah. yeah, these are, they, they are, yeah, they, they are flat, but they are not the, like the Kagami thing. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, but, but they, they are, are flat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, Professor, for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask very quickly, um, mm -hmm. where exactly do we theoretically Theoretically, predict that flat bands will emerge. Uh, no, we don't have a generic predictability. I think so. Yeah, so that's why this actually is surprising to us. We find it somehow um, magically happening here. <laughs> so we, yeah, we, we, we're still we still need to work on how to understand this. So it's just this is theoretical calculation. Yeah, theoretical calculation. So it's just based on this theoretical calculation. We try at this angle mm -hmm. match this flat band up here, and we don't know why. I uh, no, we I mean we don't have a good answer for you. But of course, if you look at look at the position of these one functions, they are located at 
Kagami position. It's just just at this parameter, you're you're having the uh, one-year function localized at the Kagami position, and by my argument at the beginning, you should get that bound. Uh, yeah. So there's still any reason why the one-year function is localized in the Kagami address? Uh, no, that's the yeah. That's why I said we don't understand it, so we, we don't know why it goes there. <laughs> yeah, okay. this is just showing. Um, yeah, so so but but this is an interesting on the other hand because for now all the Kagami materials are um, yeah you, you never get a perfect flat band in the realistic Kagami material and they always overlap with some other band or they are not not as flat as the type binding model uh, shows. Uh, so if there is a way to realize this in more uh, system, for, for, for the pro proposal I talk about here, it's still not realistic. But if there are other proposals realizing this model, uh, it will make uh, a perfect Kagami model in the more system. Um, and there are something more. Basically, uh, yeah, so these groups of three bands are you know, the um, Kagami type. And there are also groups of these four bands which, yeah, which you actually already see uh, in some earlier talks, uh, in Andrew's talk. Um, so this a new group of four bands uh, here is more disconnected. So here, here is flat, but they are they are gas model. As you can see, actually, this group of four bands um, are gas from these three bands. So um, these group of four bands are actually um, very well um, approximating um, the type binding model uh, with band structure like this. And this is known as the PXPY uh, type binding model on honeycomb matrix. Basically, um, you get you, you again get perfect exact bands. Um, and about topology, uh, we can uh, of course calculate the topology. Yeah, in this case, actually, we're focusing on these group of two bands. These are a group of two bands which uh, which uh, look like the cis bias of flat bands. Um, if you look at the topology here. Of course, at uh, final equal to zero, which is the partition cis by the team model, is flat out of our article. You should get one number like this, which is final equal to zero. And when you tune this final number away from um, zero, actually, uh, you could go into a trigger region. Yeah, so basically, this is the diagram. Um, this is the angle, basically, angle, and this W0 over W1, all at final equal to pi over two. And you can see, uh, you can actually see a transition between. And the reason uh, these bands become trivial um, is because particle symmetry is, uh, is broken. Because earlier I said with both CPVP and particle, uh, the fragile topology is stable. Um, yeah, so that finishes my yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Try to add a small perturbation to these k things to open up the gap there. Is it possible to open up the gap these layers of? I uh, yeah, of course. Just see that whether whether that band really has enough transduction number right now. If it's really similar to k mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we haven't done the calculations yet, but of course you can like break C to V symmetry and break C symmetry. You can break C to V by adding yeah, H B. Uh, you need that. No, no, they go back to back pictures. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. One yeah. of these K-values, yeah. they're going to start opening up yeah, yeah. So the chain numbers. Yeah, I believe so. In principle, because in principle, when you break those C to Z or T symmetry, they give you small mass terms uh, at these gapless points. But these gapless points are all um, Dirac, yeah, Dirac or quadratic Dirac points. So once you gap it, uh, you have to. Um, push the barrier phase into one of the bands, which would give you turn bands. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you think I should proceed or I end here? Yeah, let me ask more questions. Yeah, I think they are probably uh, Okay, um, so then I'll stop here and take questions. Are there is a uh, question. Yeah, like, uh, I have a very quick question. Mm -hmm. What the, 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 the churn banks, I mean, the Wilson group banks, I mean, you're, you're, you're getting the churn numbers mm -hmm. out there. 
Is that is that first you? I mean, is there a proceed? I mean, is it, is it that you are first preparing those Wilson loop bands out of your flat bands and then doing some calculation, or is it based on the way of seeing the in uh, the symmetry eigenvalues at high symmetry points and plotting those? Uh, so you are asking to bring the band to flat, or no? So uh, I, I was asking. So do you have the uh, the Wilson loop bands? Mm -hmm. Are you are you constructing it out of the flat bands first, and then uh, showing how they how they wind around the Villon zone, or uh, or is it just based on uh, the way you're looking at the symmetry eigenvalues at high symmetry points of flat? Is I'm getting. Uh, of course, for atomic flat bands. Um, your your flat yeah your your eigenvalues be having no winding in it, so basically it looks like it does. Um, yeah, and, and for turn bands, if, if your system has some higher symmetry, um, yeah, like C2G or something, at least you have some high symmetry points in your brain zone, uh, there is a way to tell the turn, turn bands uh, whether your, your band structure is non trivial or trivial from the symmetry eigenvalues. But it's, uh, uh, it's less, it's less um, I would say, um, it's less robust than the Wilson loop. The Wilson loop is very robust. It, you only need translation symmetry um, to define Bernoulli zone, and you can have this turn over. But with the high symmetry values, for example, if you look at a model with C3D, C3D symmetry, the high symmetry eigenvalues at high symmetry points, you can only determine the turn number up to mark three. Okay. Yeah, so there are symmetry constraints. Um, this is a more generic model. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for an interesting talk. Mm -hmm. um, can you go to the slides on the uh, uh, near commensurate uh, acoustic body amplitude? Mm -hmm. You show the very complicated spectacular bands. Uh, which there? Yeah. It, um, um, you show uh, the band structure with many, many. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so, yeah, in particular, you notice that one part uh, of it is similar to the Kagomi uh, band mm -hmm. structure. Mm -hmm. um, can you go to the, the, the the diagram you show the near commensurate with the bilayer of human lattice to, to talk about the connection to Pagomi because it's it, it's not pictorially clear to me why you would actually see this Pagomi uh, band structure here. I uh, yeah sure I mean you look at that for example one yeah, yeah, yeah. yes yeah. this one looks really like Pagomi but yeah. in real space mm -hmm. if I can you can you come up with a similar geometric frustration picture to say oh why you really have this uh, Pagomi uh, yeah. I, yeah, that that that's very difficult. So that that's something they they're still thinking about. Yeah, it, like there, uh, uh, yeah, right, like you know, you probably know actually, some people have some arguments for flat bands, uh, and for for the Bayesian or other Mori models. But uh, um, in many cases, it depends really depends on the details of the model. It's not that generic. Yeah, sometimes. They're just cancellations from different amplitudes, which give you um, obstructions. Um, yeah, but it's 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 never as clear as high body model. So it's hard to see from the near commensurate uh, super lattice picture to say that okay, right. this feature looks really like the Kagomi lattice. But that's right. why I want to. Yeah, no, it's uh, very clear. Yeah. I see. Thank you. So from your, your plot over here, um, mm -hmm. in terms of the non-dimensionalized energy access, right? Like how big would you expect the interactions like from um, mm -hmm. the Coulomb interaction or something like that to be compared to the bandwidth of the bands? Uh, in this near commemoration? Yeah, right? yeah, like yeah. Right one here. Yeah, um, yeah, I would imagine like just generic arguments. So like this part of the thing, uh, it's strongly Interacting because the unit cells are large. Yeah. You see, so usually, yeah, it's the it's the original mocking through your arguments, right? So basically, in general, when it happens, or orbitals are further from each other, your interaction becomes stronger. Um, so I would expect 
in this case is because it's a more of the nearest uh, of the Cromerian model, which would have even even larger. And actually, because uh, if you want to go to the magic angle, it's actually very large uh, in itself. So the interaction, um, yeah. So I guess I just one needs to look at the counting. I, I, yeah, actually, it's not not necessary. So usually, the Coulomb interaction deals with one over distance, right? And the band band energy usually if it's quadratic band band energy is scales with one over r squared. So the larger the r is, the stronger the interaction is. And here uh, it's not necessary. So here the interact uh, the kinetic energy is also linear in k with one over r. Um, they might have the same scaling. So I I would guess the interaction might might be larger, but uh, maybe still um, a similar ratio compared compared to the kinetic energy like like TBD. There are a bunch of like bands, and we mm -hmm. think we're not sure, but like they are from different mechanisms on making the black bands. For, for example, that mm -hmm. the first one might be the Kagome like, and the second one has some PSQ like. Uh, yeah. And so, like, do you expect if you put some kind of perturbation or interactions, then these black band will like Get behave split. differently? Or yeah, that could be. Uh, I mean, um, yeah, actually, in my next next lecture, um, we're going to show that when you add interactions, it could deform your bands into dispersive uh, bands in the Hartree-Fock sense. Uh, or actually, Andrew already talked about the charge excitation, which defines the bands, right? So the, the bands of the charge excitations are actually dispersive, even if your original three bands are flat. Um, that's one mechanism. So these bands could be become dispersive when when you have interaction. So one is dispersive, the other other some black bands are not dispersive. Uh, yeah. So that that's that's what I'm going to say next. So, okay, yeah. but here here these black bands, um, there's also a possibility that these black bands are still pretty flat because these bands are trivial. Actually, in the sense you can write down, I mean, trivial in the sense of group three bands. You can write down the type binding mod model for these three bands. Um, and the trivial bands uh, in general is more like the original mon uh, uh, Hubble model. So, for example, the Hubble model, if you kill the kinetic energy, mm -hmm. the interaction doesn't give you additional dispersion. Mm -hmm. So, in general, basically, when, uh, only when your interaction is non local, is the more non local your interaction is, the more dispersion you will get on your interaction. Um, and in general, topological bands. Don't have one-year functions, so they have a relatively delocalized one-year function. That's why they more dispersive. But uh, yeah, if somehow the interaction projected here are local enough, then these bands can still remain pretty flat. Thank you, Professor, for your wonderful talk. Um, I wanted to ask a very basic question regarding the first few slides of your. Um, Talk being that um why can we get, would it be possible for you to give a physical reason or a very brief reason why that um whenever you we have a line graph we are have we are sure that there's going to be at least one black band. Yeah, uh, actually it, it is talked in uh, Andrew's talk yesterday, but I, I don't think it's talked again. So uh, basically um, yeah. Uh, the fact that you only have hoppings uh, when you're connected by a by an underlying um, graph. Yeah, let me, I, yeah, I don't know what to name for this honeycomb lattice. So maybe the um, let me call it um, the background graph and the line graph. So if you yeah, so in general, in general, if you count the uh, if you draw a uh, graph, for example, the honeycomb lattice, you count the number of bounds. Um, it's always unequal to the number of sides. Um, so if you basically if you uh, that means the line graph and the original graph should have different number of sides. That's the first um, first effect. And then um, the fact that this line graph only have hop in when they are connected to um, with one side of the yeah basically it has to hop to one to a side of the original graph and then to another side. Um, this tells you. The actual um, number of independent degrees of freedom are given by a number of sides here. Or basically, basically you can think of the Hamiltonian as the 
square of a matrix and not square, it should be some matrix M times M dagger. And this matrix M is the hopping from the line graph size to the original size of the original graph. And this matrix has to be a rectangular matrix which uh, has some zero volume, yeah, so, so which is the different difference of the two dimensions. Um, uh, yeah, two dimensions of the matrices. Uh, so yeah, so that, that gives you give you a number of zero mode. And you have translation symmetry. So that number of zero mode has to be an integer multiple of n to give the number of that band. Is that clear or thank you, Professor? I'll I'll think about it. Uh, sure, yeah, maybe we can watch Andre's talk again. He has the Hamtoni. <laughs> Okay, uh, I think we are we're done. And let's thank Professor Dale again.